Chris, I'm here on the floor today to talk about the economy, what's going on in the jobs front, and where we go from here. Last week, the Department of Labor issued their most recent jobs report. It showed that we added 266,000 jobs in April. That was about one quarter of what was predicted. It was disappointing. It shows that job growth coming out of the pandemic has now slowed. It's a question as to why, because there are so many jobs out there. How is it that there can be so many jobs available and yet have such a disappointing April jobs report? The demand for workers is certainly high. The other thing going on out there is that we have creeping inflation. We learned this past week that the Consumer Price Index rose 4.2 percent between April 20 and, July, and April 2021. So the year, April to April, that's the highest 12-month increase going back to the summer of 2008. This whole debate going on about whether there is inflation or not, well, I would ask you to talk to your constituents because they'll tell you there's inflation. There's inflation at the gas pump. There's inflation at the grocery store. Uh, there's inflation if you're trying to build something. There is inflation throughout the economy right now, and that should concern every American. And it's because of policy choices. It doesn't have to be this way. What this argument boils down to with regard to jobs and with regard to inflation really are two very different approaches and philosophies of government and how to create jobs, how to increase wages, how to help working families. The Biden administration believes the government needs to spend more to prime the pump. This is despite us being told by every economic analysis, including the own, our own nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, that without any new stimulus, at the beginning of this year, we were going to see the economy come back, come back strongly. In fact, all the studies showed that the rate of growth this year was going to be 4 percent or more without any stimulus, without any new spending, and that by mid-year, according to the Congressional Budget Office, we'd be back to the pre-pandemic economy and economic growth. And yet, the Biden administration insisting on priming the pump, putting more money out there, the $1.9 trillion spending package was all about that. Uh, some of us raised concerns about it and warned about this. By the way, one of us who did this was Larry Summers, who was the Secretary of the Treasury under a Democratic administration and, and is a prominent economist on the other side of the aisle. But he said this, and he was right, that this risked overheating an economy that was already growing and would result in inflation. Unfortunately, the massive stimulus seems to have exactly done that. Unfortunately, now there's another wave of spending that's being projected. Over $4 trillion is being proposed in new spending in addition to the $1.9 trillion, two new packages the President talked about in his address to the Congress last week. So it's interesting because even though inflation is going up, even though the jobs market is disappointing, it seems like the administration isn't changing course. One thing they're not changing course on is they want to continue to pay people a substantial amount not to work. Now, in my view, during the COVID-19 crisis, at the heat of it, we needed to do something to help people who had lost their jobs through no fault of their own. And the state unemployment systems was a place to do that. And so we added a federal supplement on top of the state supplement, on top of the state unemployment benefit. In Ohio, the state pays about 360 bucks a week on average. It's about half of whatever your, your salary was, whatever your income was. And we added $300 on top of that. So, Think about that. Instead of $360, it's $660 per week on average. That means that for 42 percent of people who are on unemployment insurance, this is a national figure, they're making more on unemployment than they were at work. More on unemployment than they were at work. So a lot of people have made the logical decision to say, why should I be going back to work? Unfortunately, when the president has been asked about this, he says, quote, I know there's been a lot of discussion that people are being paid to stay home rather than go to work. Well, I don't see much evidence of that, end quote. Uh, with all due respect, I hope the President will talk to some of the business owners that I'm talking to, particularly small businesses. The numbers tell a different story. According to the most recent Labor Department data released just this week, at the end of March, we have 8.1 million job openings in America. That's 8.1 million jobs opening. And we all know that because we're back in our states, as we will be later today or tomorrow, and we'll see the help wanted signs. By the way, that's the highest number in history. We've never had 8 million jobs open in America. The job increases were broadly distributed based on this Labor Department study 
185,000 new job openings in restaurants and hospitality as they're getting going. Many of these restaurants are saying, this is great, we got the people coming back, but we can't find workers. 155,000 in state and local education, 81,000 in entertainment. With that demand for workers and the coronavirus pandemic substantially improving, the employment numbers should be skyrocketing. We should see so many people going back to work. This is an opportunity for people to go back, to get into their careers and get back to the dignity and self-respect that comes from work, the fulfillment that comes from work, but it's not happening. If you ask business owners in my home state of Ohio and across the country, they'll all tell you the, the same story. Business is booming, but we can't find workers. One Ohio restaurant manager said in an interview, quote, it's crazy. Honestly, we are busier than we were pre-COVID, end quote. But they can't find staff to keep up with the demand. The Dayton, Ohio Area Chamber of Commerce did a study very recently. 78% of members said they can't find the workers they need to fill the job openings they have. 78%. So why is this happening? Well, I think there are a few reasons. One is, it's true we still have a skills gap in our country, and that's something I've been working on along with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. It's a reason I authored what's called the Jobs Act, to make sure that we have this connection, don't have a skills gap, but instead have the right skills being taught to match the work needs that we have. But honestly, those numbers that I just talked about with regard to entertainment jobs and restaurant jobs and state and local education jobs, most of those jobs do not require a specialized skill. So the skills gap needs to be addressed, particularly in manufacturing, where I was told today by the National Association of Manufacturers, there are 700,000 manufacturing jobs open right now. But again, many of the jobs that are open do not require advanced skills. They just require you to show up and to be willing to do the work. It's also understandable to me that some people may be hesitant to go back to work because of COVID. But we now have these three effective vaccines that are doing the hard work <laughs> to try to get us back to a more normal lifestyle where we can get back to school and back to church and back to synagogue and, and back to work. Our nation's researchers and scientists have helped us to get to this point. And as we saw from the CDC recommendation today regarding masks, we're turning the corner. I also realize that for some people, child care is an issue. There's no question about that, the cost of child care. And if you look at the numbers in terms of people going back to work, it's true that it's disproportionately women. I agree that's an issue. But I will tell you, one of the issues we hear about as you dig deeper into this is it's because in many places the kids are not back at school. So that's a solvable problem. It's time for our children to go back to school. Again, follow CDC, follow the science. 54% of K through eight public schools were offering full-time classroom <clears throat> teaching in March. The rest were not. But I gotta tell you, none of these are the main cause of the current problem from everything I'm hearing. There are jobs and there are folks qualified to do them. They just aren't looking for work because of the way the government has chosen to pay people not to work. Wages are up, by the way. So for those who say, well, employers need to raise wages, they're up. And by the way, that's one reason we have inflation because wages are going up. Wages going up, I think, is not a bad thing, even though it'll count for some of this inflation debt that we have. But the wages going up is not going to make the difference here, because even though wages have gone up on average 4 or 5 percent, still people are not coming to work the way you would expect. Jimmy John's is offering hiring bonuses. The McDonald's locally, where I live in Cincinnati, is offering a $500 signing bonus. Chipotle is offering free college tuition after four months on the job. One wholesale distributor in Ohio is offering a $9,000 sign-on bonus for certified truck drivers. By the way, with regard to truck drivers, you know about the Colonial Pipeline and cutting off the gas supply to the East Coast of the United States and, and people who were concerned going to the gas station and, and, and getting gas in many gas stations not having any fuel available, including in states all over the, the East and the Southeast. So the answer that some people came up with that makes sense is to have trucks actually deliver that fuel to those gas stations. And so the trucks could go to the place where the fuel is, where the pipeline uh, would normally take it, and move that fuel to the gas stations. Problem? No truck drivers. They literally cannot find truck drivers to move this fuel from the depots to the gas stations. This is a real problem. I have a constituent back home who contacted me yesterday 
She is offering a $1,000 signing bonus. She can get nobody to step forward. She's got 60 jobs in Ohio. She's got 30 jobs in New York. Small business, only about 250 jobs total. She can't find anybody. And when she talks to her people, they tell her, well, as soon as the UI ends, I'll be back. As soon as the unemployment insurance federal supplement, the $300 supplement, I'll be back. Businesses simply can't compete in an environment where more than 40% of the workers are making more on the unemployment supplement than they would in their jobs. It's a problem, by the way, that states themselves are now starting to deal with because they realize this is a huge problem for their economy, for their small businesses, and for their workforce. As of this afternoon, just in the last week, 15 states have said, you know what? I'm not going to accept the $300 supplement because I want to get people back to work. And it's already making a difference. Someone just told me from the state of Montana, one of our colleagues from there, and Montana was the first state to do this about a week ago, that a hotel owner told him that he was in desperate need of people, and when he would put the Help Wanted sign on and, and ask people to come, he could get one person to show up per week. This week, 60 people showed up. Why? Because the unemployment insurance is running out, and people are now looking for work. So these states, I think, are going to continue to do this. I think it'll be more than 15 by the time we finish speaking here this afternoon. It's because the states realize, by the way, this is a competitive advantage. If New York doesn't do it, and Ohio does, and by the way, Ohio is one of the states that just made the decision to do it this afternoon. If New York doesn't do it, that business person I talked about is going to do more manufacturing in Ohio, because that's where she has the workforce. That will help Ohio relative to state, a state that wouldn't choose to move on beyond the $300 supplement. Unemployment insurance is important, and it's still going to be there, but it'll be the state benefit that it's always been. The other thing is the work requirement. In unemployment insurance, again, in Ohio, it's about 50% of whatever your wages are, and then there's a requirement that you look for work. And if you get an offer, you know, you can't stay on unemployment insurance. That's always been the tradition. Under COVID, states accepted waivers not to have to require people to look for work. About 30 states now, just in the last few weeks, have decided to get rid of that waiver, including Ohio. Why? Because, again, it's not helping anybody. It's not helping the workers. It's not helping the small businesses, certainly. And it's certainly not helping the taxpayer, who are paying tens of billions of dollars for these supplements. I will say, when I debated this on the Senate floor, when we had an amendment that actually passed during the COVID-19 legislation, later that amendment was amended, uh, but we tried to end the unemployment insurance sooner, given the economic numbers that were out there. Um, one of the Democrat colleagues on the other side said that, do I think that Ohio workers somehow are, uh, you know, don't, don't have work ethic or are lazy? That's not what I think at all. I don't think they're lazy at all. I think they're logical. And I think, you know, common sense dictates that when you're offering to pay somebody more not to work than to work, you're likely to get a bad result. So, again, it was needed when people were losing their jobs for no fault of their own. The COVID-19 devastated, really ravaged so many sectors of our economy. A lot of the sectors are coming back and coming back strong, but they need workers and they need them desperately. The stakes couldn't be higher. Let me illustrate why. If workers don't go back to work, some businesses will actually close and these jobs will go away permanently. That, to me, is a reality. Take Geordie's Restaurant in Columbus, Ohio. Geordie shut down a couple weeks ago because they couldn't find enough job applicants to keep the lights on, period. They shut down. This is a restaurant that made it through the worst of the pandemic when our restaurant and hospitality industry was in really tough shape. But his owner, Jordy Hall Jones, said himself, and I quote, we fought hard to get through COVID, but COVID didn't kill us. The stimulus did. The COVID didn't kill us. The stimulus did. That's a quote from a business owner. That's the difference, again, between the philosophy that the Biden administration seems to be taking and, frankly, reality and the philosophy that we're encouraging, which is let's get people back to work. Let's get this economy moving again. The president is committed to spending an unprecedented amount of tax dollars to try and get what it takes to get the economy back on track. But spending more tax dollars isn't a prescription to what ails our economy today. Getting people back to work certainly is. If we don't, again, businesses will close. Careers cannot be continued. People won't get the fulfillment that they get from going to work. And many of these jobs will not return. Instead of following this path, let's change course. Let's follow common sense, get our country back to work so we can all enjoy the goods and services we work to provide for each other. Let's help our nation's small businesses, which are the lifeblood of so many of our economies. Let's help people currently on unemployment get started building lasting careers that they enjoy, make a living, 
find long-term stability so they can realize their American dream. That's what this country is all about. So today I'm urging the Biden administration to take two simple steps to encourage people to move past the pandemic and to get back to work. First, we need to re-implement the federal requirement that people must actively be searching for work if they're going to receive unemployment. Again, Ohio has made that decision, as have about 30 other states, but let's make this the national standard that it was prior to the pandemic. Long-term unemployment doesn't benefit anyone and will ensure that people are able to get off unemployment insurance more quickly. Second, we need to draw down the federal unemployment supplement funded by COVID-19 that passed in March. It's time to look at ending this not on September 6, as it's currently slated to end, but now, while the economy is strong and growing, while we're trying to get people back to work, as I said, it's a rational economic decision for many people right now to collect an unemployment check that effectively pays you upwards of $15 an hour to stay at home and not work, but makes no sense to keep this supplement in place as we are reopening. And the focus is on shifting toward getting the economy back up and running. My own preference is that some of this fund be used to pay people a bonus to go back to work. I know that's controversial on my side of the aisle, but I'll tell you, I think it works. Montana's doing it, it's working for them. How about 100 bucks a week instead of the $300 supplement, 100 bucks a week for six weeks as a return to work bonus? To me, that makes a lot of sense. That would be something I think we could get some bipartisan support for around here. And that would help the workers, the small businesses, and our economy. Through these two steps, we can create the disincentive to work that was a byproduct of our response to an unprecedented pandemic. We can stop that disincentive to work. Now that we are beating COVID-19, we should focus on getting back to normal. I urge the Biden administration to focus on getting the economy back up and running and getting folks off the sidelines and back to work. I yield the floor.